my pleasure to uh, to introduce uh, Dr. Catherine Hayhoe. And as I mentioned, she flew in. I mean, she got here. I think she landed like at four or something, and then she's flying out um, right after. Actually, before or after this, uh, she's going to have to skedaddle like at like six thirty or something. So what I'm going to say is, um, when we get into the questions, those who've got very pressing uh, Catherine Hayhoe questions, those might rise to the top. So uh, Catherine uh, is a professor in the Public Administration Program at, at Texas Tech University and director of the Climate Science Center at Texas Tech, which is part of the Department of the Interior's South Central Climate Science Center. Her research focuses on developing and applying high-resolution climate projections to uh, evaluate the future impacts of climate change on human society and the natural environment. She has published over 125 peer-reviewed abstracts and publications and served as lead author on key reports for the U.S. Global, uh, uh, Global Change Research Program and the National Academy of Sciences, including the second, third, and fourth U.S. National Climate Assessment, and uh, most recently the 2017 Climate Science Special Report that just came out about uh, a month ago. Um, she is chair of the Earth Science Women's Network Advisory Council and in 2017 was named one of Fortune's 50 World's Greatest Leaders. So um, please uh, welcome Dr. Catherine Hale. Thank you. It's great to be here with everybody. This is awesome. Isn't it exciting? Yes. So I don't know if you... Oops. I don't know if you get this, but I get this, especially living in Texas. When you go somewhere else, people kind of roll their eyes a little bit and say, Texas, nobody's doing anything about climate change in Texas, are they? And I say, yes, they are. <laughs> and San Antonio is now one of those leaders. Yeah. I think that's something to be really proud of. And it's definitely a story that I'm going to be taking where, where I go telling people about this because... The reality is, is that Texas is unique. We are uniquely vulnerable to a changing climate, but we are also uniquely positioned to fix this thing. So that's what we're going to be talking about a little bit today. Why do we care about this and what can we do? We know that our normal climate looks like this. It can be wet and dry, it can be hot and cold, and if we live in Texas, it looks like this. Have you ever had the experience where you go into a movie theater and it's 95 degrees out and you leave and it's 55 and sleeting almost? Anybody? Yeah, exactly. If you don't like the weather, you just wait. It'll change. We know here in Texas, when we just look at the last few years, we have seen record-breaking droughts. You remember the droughts? Yeah. We have seen crazy wildfires. We have seen dust storms so big that they get fancy names. Haboobs, this is the Texas Tech Stadium. And then a year later, this is the same Texas Tech Stadium. We get crazy floods. No, this is not Houston, this is Lubbock. Yeah, that's the, the six lane freeway that goes past the football stadium and those are the undergraduates floating away. And then, of course, we get even more devastating, completely off the charts, record-breaking floods like we saw this past year in Houston. And then guess what? When you look at the drought map, this is today, we're back in drought. Yeah, it's a La Nina winter, which is usually a dry winter, and 72% of the state is already back in drought. So Texas has the craziest ups and downs you will ever see, and people are justified in asking, well, why on earth does climate change matter? It matters because this up and down, up and down pattern that is so amplified here in Texas of wet, dry, wet, dry, and hot, cold, hot, cold, this pattern is built on an assumption that we don't often take out and look at very closely, and that is the assumption that even though things vary significantly from day to day, week to week, even year to year, over the long term, over 20 to 30 years, over the long term, the time scales over which we do most of our planning, our water planning, building our transportation infrastructure and our building codes, our energy planning, over the long term, we assume that it all averages out, number one. And number two, we assume that 
the worst events in the past are a predictor of how bad it's going to be in the future, right? Yeah, that's good. I heard a couple of people over here say no. <laughs> that is correct, because you know how many 500-year floods Houston has had in the last three years? Three. That's right. That is not a 500-year flood. That's a one-year flood now. The past is not a perfect predictor for the future. What types of things depend on this assumption? Our building codes, how we build our buildings, what type of crops we grow and where, where our flood zones are, and even our water plan. It assumes that where we've been in the past is a good predictor of the future, but what happens if things are changing? And even worse, what happens if not just the average is changing, what happens if the variability is changing? The best metaphor, the best mental picture that I have for the situation that we're in today is one that you get when you're driving along the road in West Texas. If you're driving along the road in West Texas, you know that it is so flat that for some parts, for example, of I-27, you could be driving up I-27, not just staying on the road, but even staying in your lane if you were looking in your rearview mirror. Why? Because it is so straight that where you will be in the future is perfectly predicted from where you were in the past. No, don't. <laughs> do not try it. And if you did, don't say that I said to try it, because I'm not. Because if you are going up I-27 on that dead straight road, just before you get to Plainview, Texas, there's a giant curve in the road. And not just a giant curve, there's a row of concrete grain silos on that curve. What happens if you are driving down the road, looking in your rear view mirror backwards at the past, assuming that's a perfect predictor of the future? What happens? Okay, if you, if you don't know the answer, they're going to be collecting your driver's license at the door. <laughs> you are going to run off the road. You're going to end up where you don't want to be. And so planning for the future based on the past is like driving down the road looking in the rearview mirror. It works great when the road is straight and when climate is stable. But today, we are already on the curve. Climate is already changing, and the wheels of the collective bus that you and I and every person in Texas is riding in, the wheels of our buses are already on the rumble strip. And we are actually hearing the noise of the rumble strip when we see the increasing risk of what used to be entirely natural disasters now exacerbated by a changing climate. How do we know that we're already on the curve? Well, when we look around Texas, we see not, we're not looking at change in weather from day to day. That's like a single tree. Weather's what happens in a certain place at a certain time. We're looking at the forest. We're looking at the changes that we see over 20 to 30 years or more. And when we look at these changes, what we see is that yes, every season in Texas is getting warmer and has been getting warmer since the 1950s. For many, not all, but for many parts in Texas, our heavy precipitation events are increasing. We've always had droughts, that's a normal part of life, but the droughts get stronger the hotter it is and they last longer. And don't even get started on hurricanes. We know that sea levels rising, amplifying the risks of coastal flooding. We know that hurricanes get almost all of, their, all of their energy from warm ocean water and the oceans are warming. And we know that the amount of precipitation associated with storms, including hurricanes, is increasing, becoming more severe. Here in San Antonio, this is San Antonio. In San Antonio, winter's been warming at 0.7 degrees Fahrenheit per decade. So if you've lived here for two years, that's almost one and a half degrees, or 20 years, that's one and a half degrees. Summer has been warming about half a degree per decade. But it isn't just the changes in the averages. We care about a changing climate because it's making our heat waves stronger and more frequent. And here in San Antonio, if we look at the days per year over 80 degrees, over 90 degrees, and over 100 degrees, they are all ticking up. That is right here where you live. Heavy precipitation is also getting more frequent. Why? Because the warmer it is, the more water evaporates. And all of that water is sitting up there in the atmosphere waiting for a storm to come along, sweep it up, and dump it on us. The biggest increases are up in the Northeast and the Midwest, but we're seeing significant increases in many parts of Texas, especially in the Southeast. What do we see here in San Antonio? 
What's really interesting is when we look at our historical records, our precipitation, the amount of rainfall we get year to year, it's getting more variable. If you look at you know, the 1960s to the 1980s versus the 1980s till now, you can see that it's starting to go up and down and up and down and up and down. And when you look at the heavy precipitation, this is the wettest five days of the year, you can see that the ups and downs have gotten even more extreme. The way I think of the impacts of climate change on Texas are, you have this natural pattern of up and down and up and down, and it's being stretched. That's why we care. We care because it takes the risks we already face today and it exacerbates them. Now, Texas is already at risk from all kinds of natural risks, right? We get, if you're only talking about weather and climate, we're not talking about anything else, just weather and climate, we get tornadoes, dust storms, haboobs, not earthquakes because they're geologic, weather and, weather and climate only, but we got a few more to go. We have, let's see, hailstorms, blizzards, sleet, ice storms, heat waves, droughts, heavy rainfall events, floods, hurricanes, tornadoes. What am I missing? No, not earthquakes. They're geologic. Um, not volcanic eruptions either. We don't have those. Lightning storms, severe lightning storms. Did I mention hail? We get everything here in Texas already. And if the reason why we care about a changing climate is because it takes the risks we face today and we exas it exacerbates them, it is no surprise that out of every state in the entire country, Texas is number one in terms of the most weather and climate disasters that have cost over a billion dollars worth of damage each since 1980. We are at 94 events and counting. Why? Because we already get it all naturally. Pretty much the only thing we don't get is like glacial lake outburst floods. We have to have some more topography to get those. And that's why we are also uniquely vulnerable to a changing climate because we are already naturally exposed to all of these risks. So how do we prepare for an uncertain future? We're on a curve and we can't see the curve 100% clearly because it's in the future. We can see the past quite clearly. We know we're on the curve. We can sort of make out the curve as if I'm looking at it without my glasses on. But there's some uncertainty in the future because it hasn't happened yet. How do we account for this when we're planning for a changing climate, when we're building resilience, when we're turning that steering wheel and making sure that we're negotiating the curve together? Where we start is with what we know. How has San Antonio already been affected by weather and climate risks in the past? We know what drought looks like. We know what heat waves look like. We know what heavy precipitation and flooding looks like. We know what impacts they have already had on the city. We know, this is just this past year alone, it isn't even to the end of the year. We know what types of events we get. There's hailstorms, there's flooding, there's severe weather, there's tornadoes. There wasn't drought this year, but there could be drought next year. We know what these risks look like. And for some purposes, the first thing we can do is just build the resilience to the risks we already face today. Let me give you an example. Moore, Oklahoma. What comes to mind when you hear that, unless you have relatives living there? Tornadoes. You know how many tornadoes have gone through Moore, Oklahoma? We are studying how climate change is interacting with all kinds of weather phenomena, but tornadoes are one of the hardest ones to pin down because they happen over such small spatial scales for just a few minutes up to maybe an hour. The longest tornado ever it was, I think, about three hours long, and that was the longest ever. So tornadoes are really difficult to understand how they're going to change in a changing climate, but we know they're not going away, are they? So if you live in Moore, Oklahoma, it just makes all the sense in the world, for example, to build resilience to the risks that already exist because they're not going away. Other things, though, we know that the trend is there. We know, for example, in San Antonio that precipitation is getting more variable and that heavy, high temperature days are ticking up. So given that trend, how can we build resilience into our infrastructure, our water, our health, our natural ecosystems, our parks, our schools, our energy supply. 
how can we build that resilience to a trend that we know is already happening today? But then for some cases, we need more information. For example, if we're a city that's replacing its storm sewer system, we need to know, do we need to put in new pipes that are this big or new pipes that are this big? There's a different cost associated with those pipes. If we're resurfacing the airport runways, we need to know, should we use a material that melts over this degrees Fahrenheit or over this? How hot is it going to get in the future? Sometimes we need more information. And so the one thing we do know, though, is that if we only use the past, we're going to get the wrong answer. We need this future information. So this is a lot of what I do and a lot of what, what we're planning on doing here, right? We're planning on taking these pictures of the future, different pictures, and we're saying, what are we going to avoid? What, are, what impacts are we going to be able to avoid if we can transition from old dirty ways of getting energy, coal, gas, and oil, if we can transition to clean ways of getting energy that we have so much of here in Texas? Last year, we got 12% of our energy from wind. Statewide, the goal is 25% within just a few years, and we actually hit 21% the first quarter of this year when it was super windy. Solar is expanding across the state, and Texas is uniquely poised, not just to lead the U.S., but to lead almost all the world, except for China and India, which are so far ahead we cannot catch up with them. But Texas is uniquely poised to lead the country and to lead much of the world in this new clean energy. So what impacts could be avoided by choosing a different future is the first question we can ask. But then the second question we can ask is, what are the impacts that are going to happen no matter how hard we try, no matter how well we do, that we need to prepare for so that when they come along, when that 500-year flood turns into the 10-year flood, when the 10-year flood turns into the 1-year flood, when days over 100 degrees become as frequent as days over 90 degrees used to be, let's make sure we're prepared for when those happen. And what does that type of preparation look like? I have a couple of examples for you. One of the first cities that I was called in to work with was the city of Chicago. And I will never forget that. Now, this was a ways back before cities were doing all this newfangled climate things. But, but Chicago had a very progressive mayor and a very progressive Department of Environment. So they said, we're going to look at climate resilience in Chicago. And this was more than 10 years ago. They called in me and a couple other climate scientists and they put us in a room with some bag lunches and some representatives from every city department, and they closed the door. And you could see everybody was in there thinking, oh, okay, here I am. I got a dry ham sandwich, and I have to sit here listening to these people yak for a couple hours. So we said, okay, you tell us. We're here to learn from you. What ways have you seen your city affected by weather and by climate events? And so people started to say, well, you know, flooding is actually a pretty big deal in Chicago. You might not have known that. We're also worried about pollution in the lake. We're worried about extreme heat days. And then people started to get a little bit excited. They're like, well, so the Chicago Transit Authority, they said, well, our rail lines warp over 94 degrees. And we have to shut down the rapid transit rail that takes people out to the suburbs. And we have to bust them. And everybody hates it. And it costs us a ton of money. Can you develop projections showing, not day, not day by day, not year by year, but decade by decade, how many more days over 94 degrees we'll have? Because at a certain point, it's going to be cheaper to just replace the rails than to keep on shutting down. And we said, yeah, yeah, we could actually do that. And so then the emergency response department said, oh, well, could you tell us how many days there'll be over 92? I was like, yeah, yeah, we could do that too. Why? Because we staff by the thermometer. Over 92 degrees, we need about double the staff in the south side of Chicago because people get irritated. People get angry. There's also health crises. People who already have problems breathing, people who are elderly or sick, the heat really gets them. And a lot of people are afraid to open their window at night because it isn't very safe in the neighborhoods where they live and they can't afford their air conditioning. And then the people who do the Chicago River said, oh, well, is there any way to translate that into lake levels? And I said, well, we could work with the Great Lakes Research Lab and we could see if we could do something on the Great Lakes levels. Why? Well, they said, because we've engineered the Chicago River to flow backwards out of the Great Lakes down into the river system. 
because it's so polluted that if it flowed in its natural way into Lake Michigan, it would violate the International Joint Commission on the Great Lakes Pollution Standards. So will there ever be a situation where Lake Michigan drops so low that the Chicago River starts flowing back into Lake Michigan because we would be in serious trouble if that happened? You can see I had no idea about any of these things before stepping into the room. But we were able to collect the information from everybody who was there. They got a little bit of extra motivation from the fact that a bunch of insurance companies decided they were going to sue the city of Chicago and Cook County for failing to adequately prepare for the impacts of a changing climate on flood risk. Nothing to motivate you like a little lawsuit, is there? And when it all was said and done, we found that 14 out of the city departments, including the public school department, including the department that runs all the outdoor festivals where people don't show up if it's too hot and humid, including the people who do all the energy supply for the city, 14 out of 18 city departments were able to identify specific ways in which they were affected by temperature or rainfall or humidity or some type of change. And we were able to develop over 120 indicators for Chicago that helped the parks department determine when a tree died, what type of tree should they replace it with? A tree that is native some distance south in Illinois, because by the time that tree is grown, it will be in the perfect climate for that tree. How cool is that? Or a measurement of how frequently heat waves would recur in the city, and therefore how beneficial it would be for the city to lower its urban heat island by green roofs and tree planting. So that as climate change pushes the temperature of the city up, the city is actually lowering its own temperature. Because to a certain extent, cities actually have their hand on their own thermostat. They can reduce the urban heat island effect and mitigate a lot of the heat impacts in the city. So we looked at how frequently heat waves would occur and how frequently blackouts, energy blackouts might occur. We looked at how frequently storm sewers would flood, and this over here is a map. The red area is, is storm sewers that have flooded with sewage overflow. We looked at the number of days per year with at least 2.4 inches of rain in 24 hours. Where do we get 2.4 inches from? From the people who know what it takes to have a sewage overflow. And then, a couple of years later, I was like, okay, so what's going on in Chicago? I was giving a presentation on this, and I was like, you know, has anything happened in Chicago? I'm curious what else they did besides the green roofs. So I looked it up, and that very week when I was looking it up, there were two headlines that exact week. New sewers quickly dispatch heavy rains and massive new reservoir to help alleviate Chicago area flooding. Isn't that awesome? They're doing it. It can be done. So what's the big picture here? How can we move forward into an uncertain future recognizing that we are already on the curve. The first step, number one, is to acknowledge that our risks are changing. Whether that consists of redrawing flood zone maps or in the West acknowledging that the wildfire season is increasing in length and that wildfires are burning more and more area as they are today in the LA area. We need to recognize that the disaster risk that we face is a function. It's a function of exposure, how many people, how much valuable infrastructure is at risk. It's a function of the weather and climate events. Some, not all, but many of which are increasing in frequency or intensity or both. And so it's even more important to make sure that we're decreasing our vulnerability. That we're looking at people. We're looking at places. We're looking at public systems that are already vulnerable today, and we are doing everything we can to build them up, to make them resilient through social networks, through improved building codes, through large projects, through small steps, whatever it takes to make us more resilient. And then, once we know what the risks are and how they're changing, we can prepare for them. One of the biggest risks that the Netherlands faces is sea level rise, right? I mean, a large area of the Netherlands is already below sea level, and sea level is rising. It's risen only about eight inches in the last century, and it's projected to rise anywhere between 
know, three up to possibly eight feet the rest of the century. That's a huge rise. You don't have to worry about that here directly. But where will people go when two thirds of the largest cities in the world are within a few feet of sea level? Yeah. So what are they doing in the Netherlands? One of the things they're doing is they're building floating villages. So if sea level goes up three or four feet, you go to the local uh, hardware store and you get a few more feet of anchor chain. Big deal. What are they doing in Chicago? As I talked about, one of the things they're doing is putting in green roofs. It lowers your energy costs, both your heating and your cooling. It provides a great place for people to eat lunch, and it also lowers the urban heat island effect. Simple things we can do are just increase the reflectivity of the city. Lighter shingles reflect more energy. Dark shingles absorb the energy. A lot of renewable energy sources are more resilient than old ways of getting energy because they don't need water. So during drought, they're not at risk. And people are also doing smart things like putting in riparian zones by rivers so that when they flood, there's an area that's built there to take up that flood water rather than letting it flood valuable infrastructure. You know, I could go for hours. You kind of get the picture, right? I mean, we're talking about this huge diversity of actions. But what does it start with? It starts with an awareness of risk in the place where you live. And then it progresses with creative ideas where everybody comes to the table on solutions. Solutions that could be all types of solutions. So, you know, insulating our houses. Installing power walls. Have you guys heard about the power wall? It costs about three and a half thousand dollars. It's a giant battery you put in your garage and actually stores enough energy for you to run your entire house and plug in your car if you have a plug in. And you can charge it from the grid or you can charge it from the shingles on your roof if you get solar shingles. Yeah, not panels anymore, they got shingles. Improving our transportation options so that we reduce our carbon emissions and we reduce infrastructure maintenance at the same time. How can we figure out win-win-win solutions that we're not just doing to build resilience to a changing climate, we're doing it to improve our quality of life, to improve the welfare of the people who live here, to make our lives better, more enjoyable, give us more time, more freedom, and at the same time reduce our emissions and make us more resilient. It all starts with a shared understanding and a shared commitment, and that's what this event is all about, isn't it? So if you want more examples, this is called CAKE. That's easy to remember, right? CAKE. Climate Adaptation Knowledge Exchange. It has tons of case studies from all over the entire country. But the bottom line, though, is this. When you are driving down the road and you realize you're on a curve, is the smartest thing to do to just jam on your brakes and come to a dead stop? No, because what would happen? person behind you would go right into your bumper. We are on a curve, but we don't have to stop. We can, number one, build our resilience to the risks we already know are real. Number two, we can increase our resilience to the risks that we know are getting stronger or more frequent. Number three, we can incorporate quantitative information to figure out exactly what we have to do for things that are going to intensify where it actually makes a significant difference in terms of, you know, what pipes we put in, how much water we're preparing for. But the bottom line is we can move forward. We can keep on going around that curve, doing so in a safe and a responsible manner to make sure that we're all going to be okay. I really do think that is possible. We have to plan for the curve to ensure a safe future for all of us. Thank you. So we have a panel setting up here, but I can take some questions. I've just been told I'm allowed to take some questions while we're waiting for the panel to set up. So have at it. Questions? Yes, right there. <laughs> because it gives me hope. One of the biggest questions I get these days is, what gives you hope? Because when you listen to the news, when I look at what's happening in, in, the, in the science to this planet, that doesn't give me hope. 
What gives me hope is going out and talking to people, feeling like I'm doing what I can do to make a difference, and encouraging other people to do what they can do to make a difference. That's where my hope comes from, hearing about all the amazing things that are happening here in San Antonio. That's going to keep me going for weeks, possibly months. All right, yes, right here. What's the biggest thing that we individuals need to be doing to spread the word? The answer was actually right in your question. The number one thing that we can do is talk about it. Because did you know when they surveyed people across the whole U.S. and they said, they didn't say, do you talk about a changing climate and how it affects you and what we can do to fix it. They said, how many times a year do you hear somebody else talk about it? Do you know 75% of people in the entire country said less than once or twice a year? Why would we care about something if we never hear anybody talking about it? That is why the answer was right there in your question. Talking about this is so important. But not talking about, you know, what's happening down in Antarctica or up in the poles. Talking about what's happening in here, here in San Antonio. Why you care because it's affecting things that you care about in the place where you live. And even more importantly, what we're doing to fix it. Because if we feel like there's this giant problem that we could never fix, who wants to talk about that? We want to talk about something that we can fix. And that's why solutions are so important. All right. Thank you. We're taking more questions now, but we're going to do so with the whole panel. What an amazing presentation. If there are any other questions, you want to take a few more questions? Yeah. A few more questions? Yeah, yeah. Go. Sure. I guess just before we uh, get a question for Dr. Hayhoe, part of this is a process of hearing from you guys on thoughts you have on ideas that should be part of the San Antonio plan. So we want to get to that as well, but let's let's take advantage of Dr. Hayhoe here sure. while we have her. He's very patiently had his hand up for a little while. Yes. I heard. I could repeat. Is this on? Okay. Um, thank you. So, uh, so I, I did not plant him there. Um, but what what he was asking <laughs> did I know? Um, what he was asking was just to make sure that you're aware of a short PBS digital series that we have on YouTube called Global Weirding. They're super short videos. One of them is about how Texas is the best and the worst when it comes to changing climate. Um, another one is about hurricanes and extreme weather. We've got them on all different topics. And we also do live Facebook Q&A every couple of weeks, too, where we get people from around the world, which is just amazing. We're looking at doing thematic Q&As in the new year, and I think it'd be great to do a San Antonio live Q&A. That'd be so fun. Absolutely. Yeah. The, name, the name of the series is Global Weirding. And if you just Google that, it's on YouTube and on Facebook, Global Weirding. Not warming. Weirding. Yeah, one of the front here. Oh. What, uh, what kind of vibe do you get from our glorious legislature? <laughs> uh, let's just put it this way. There is a lot of action happening at the city level all across Texas. Um, cities are, what's going on, not just, not just in, in San Antonio, not just in Austin, what's happening in Houston, what's happening in Dallas, um, what's happening even in smaller towns. I worked with San Angelo last year, of all things. It's really amazing what's going on at the city level because at the city level is where you see the impacts, but at the city level too is where you can take the action. So that's that's where I find the hope and the encouragement. And this is not just happening in Texas, it's happening around the whole world. Cities are emerging as true global leaders in innovation and in building resilience um, and cutting carbon. There's a new book out called, um, I think it's called City of Hope, and it's talking specifically about the roles that cities play. Hello. Um, how serious should we take the severity of animal agriculture and the effects that it has on our planet? Sure. Um, so I don't think that urban farming is a big deal inside San Antonio, is it? Not like cows running? No. No. There's, there's, no. there's not even there's like... There's a few cows. <laughs> goats. Go, goats. Chickens. Yeah. Well, cutting grass. Not a bad idea. No, but, but in all seriousness, though, um, the reason why this issue of climate change is such a big deal is because there's no one silver bullet that just
just fixes everything at the same time. About a quarter of our contribution to this problem comes from transportation. About a quarter comes from agriculture, which includes not just the actual, you know, raising of animals like cows that produce a ton of methane, but also includes deforestation and unsustainable uh, cropping practices. And then we've got industry, then we've got our building stock and our electricity generation. There's no one silver bullet that fixes everything, but at the same time, there are so many little things that we can do. So eating local, eating lower down the food chain is, depending on our lifestyle, can be just as, if not more important, than taking public transportation to work. That's why I love carbon footprint calculators. I don't know if you've ever tried one of those. Um, if a uh, cool calculator from Berkeley is one of them, but there's a bunch of others. You log in and you enter all the details about your life and it shows you where your personal carbon emissions come from and it's different for every person. Um, and then it shows you what you can do to reduce them. And I think there's actually a really cool program where they're, do they're pioneering it in California, but I'm sure it's something that you know can be brought to Texas where it's an online program where neighborhoods can do this and you can join up with your block or with your Girl Scout troop, or with your church group, and you can compete against others to lower your collective footprint. It's a really cool competition. I think they're running it in a couple of little towns in California. And it's really awesome because if you want to do something, there's somebody on that program to help you. Like, I want to do this thing at my house, but where do I buy X? Well, it turns out your neighbor 10 blocks away did X, and they can come over and help you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, it's called Google. Oh, it is? Okay. Very cool. Thank you. Is that the name of the app? Because we want to capture it. Uh, no, that wasn't what I was thinking of. Okay. Jewel Bugs. Jewel Bugs in so, Austin's using that. Okay. There, there must be a couple of different ones then. But I think that's a great way because working together is so much, it's so much more encouraging, isn't it, than feeling like I'm the only person who's doing anything and nobody else is doing anything. So. Yes. Uh, I was wanting to know if you were able to have a conversation with Scott Pruitt. What would be the first thing you would talk about? <laughs> <laughs> That, that is a good question. Um, when One of our global weirding videos is actually about talking to people about climate change. And it begins by saying, you know, if I just tell them the facts, they'll change their mind, right? And the answer is no. <laughs> no. Climate change has become one of the most politicized topics in the entire country. And so when I talk to anyone, what I try to do is figure out, well, what makes them tick? What values do they hold dear? What is really important to them that influences their decisions? And is there anything, and for 99.9% .9 of people there is, is there anything that I can connect to with them, that a value that I genuinely share or agree with, that I could use to connect to the impacts of a changing climate? Whether it's the fact that clean energy builds our local economy here in Texas. Whether it's the fact that um, energy independence actually has a huge huge benefit for national security, um, whether it's the fact that, uh, you know, removing subsidies on all fuels, fossil fuels and renewables, would actually create a more equitable free market than the current distortion we have where fossil fuels are subsidized to the tune of nearly $170,000 a second. Um, so, yeah, yeah, I'm not sure if I want to talk about that or not, but yes. So, so what, whoever you're talking with, take some time to get to know them first and figure out what makes them tick and then connect the dots between what they genuinely care about and changing climate. Okay, uh, next question up here. Have you been approached by anyone representing the fossil fuels industry uh, asking you for your advice as to how they could develop best practices? Yes, yes I have. That's good news. It is, yeah, it's great news. <laughs> <laughs> that um, there's no magic switch that we, we can flip today to turn, to turn off <clears throat> all our fossil fuels, so their services are still needed. But we're nearing the end of an era. Um, and people who produce oil and gas, though, that can be used for other things. You don't have to burn it. In fact, I think in 50 or 80 years, people are going to be horrified that we used to burn this stuff. They're going to be like, what are you talking about? We need it for all these other things. But, but just in the same way that horse farmers and buggy manufacturers had to recognize that the Model T had come along, in the same way, people who have built their expertise on ways of getting energy that we are already transitioning off right here in Texas have to look down the road, recognize that we're on the curve. And the reason why they called me in is because they recognize that we are on the curve. And what I say to them is, 
you know energy. You know energy better than anyone else. You've been doing energy for decades. So how can you continue to do energy in the future? Now's the time to ask yourself that question and to answer it fast. Hi, my question is, um, sometimes I'm, I'm troubled by the word resilience because the focus seems to be on fixing something that's broken rather than trying to get at its root cause and conservation. Can you talk a little bit about conserving? I mean, it hasn't been since Jimmy Carter when we were encouraged to drive 55 miles an hour and wear a sweater in our home. That message really isn't given to the public. Mm -hmm. I think they're two different things, and actually I would love to hear you guys comment a bit on this too. But when I, when I use the word resilience, I specifically mean building resilience to the impacts that are coming no matter what we do. A certain amount, just, just as if you smoked a pack of cigarettes a day for 30 years and then you stopped, a certain amount of damage is built into the system. We're already on the curve, and we have to prepare for the impacts and conservation is not going to eliminate all the impacts. But at the same time, reducing our energy use and conserving as well as switching to new sources, that is gonna help the curve not be nearly as steep. We're gonna be able to make it around the curve if it can reduce and eventually eliminate our carbon emissions. So we have to be doing both. We don't have the luxury of picking anymore. We can't just adapt or mitigate. We have to do both. So let's, let's open it up. Talk about I that. think that's the logic that, that, we, that the mm -hmm. scope of work was based on. That's mm -hmm. the logic that our team is working based on. Exactly what you said is that mitigation and adaptation are not mutually exclusive. It's really, we need to be doing both at the same time. There are things that will happen no matter what, you, what we do. There are changes that unfortunately have happened in the climate. And we need to be ready for those. But at the same time, we need to make sure that we don't get more of that, and that's where mitigation comes into play. So I think you're absolutely correct. Excellent. I mean, I, the only other thing I would add to that is in terms of what are we trying to be resilient to, um, yeah. and and yeah. you know when we've and resilience has become a, a big point of discussion um, in the community at, at city council, and resilience basically covers the board. Are we talking about cybersecurity? Are we talking mm -hmm. about resilience of, um, of, of residents and neighborhoods? And so I think you know as we start having those those discussions really understanding being clear what, what we're trying to accomplish but I think it, it's and that's part of the plan is to that's the idea of looking at the climate projections and not just looking at what the future holds but looking at where we are now um, you know are we resilient now as a community as mm -hmm. well as building an additional adaptive capacity for those future impacts and, and that's another basis for, for for our work we hope we hope that that when we end up getting, making decisions, the decisions that are based on information, that are based on, on data, that are based on actual objective assessments, uh, not just on, on, on pref personal preferences or anything like that. So, so we see our role as providing the city and providing the community with that basis, that objective basis that you can use to hopefully make very good decisions. Yeah. You know, for me, uh, energy efficiency is a huge opportunity. It's the lowest cost lever to, to go after uh, not using energy. And, you know, when you see people put solar panels on an inefficient home, to me, that's a huge missed opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. Get the energy efficiency right, go with the solar, and now you've got a low carbon footprint. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. All right. Um, hello. So what is the, the city doing to protect the water? And what are we, what are we going to do to preserve the mm -hmm. San Antonio recharge zone? So, you know, I think, and I, I think there was, um, apparently I sort of heard there was a, pretty robust conversation today um, re regarding um, saws and, and sort of the future of where, where we're going. I think you know, when we start looking at climate um, impacts and you start looking at what um, extreme heat means uh, in terms of changing um, water cycles, and you know, so I think one of the things that we really have to look at through this planning process is really understanding what those future dynamics are because again you know we could take a look at the you know where we are with with um, our current water um, uh, resources and it may it looks good but it's are things to be different um, 20 40 60 years from now I, I think you know we need to continue with the concerted effort that's been going on in, in terms of protecting um, the, the the Edwards um, aquifer and the, and the recharge zone in particular I think um, there's movements with uh, the River Authority, the city and other partners really looking at, okay, well, how do we continue moving with low impact developments, uh, improving um, uh, uh, best practices to ensure that uh, you know, we are not just treating the water, but basically allowing as much to infiltrate. Um, I think there's lots of conversations that are gonna have to go forward through this next 
year and a few months to really uh, look at what are those strategies that, that we, we need to, um, to employ to get us where we, we need. I mean, I think, and again, only being in San Antonio for three and a half years, the one thing that's really sort of struck me is just how much work has been done already uh, around um, uh, protecting our water resources. Um, but there's there's always more to do. Yeah. And we're fortunate, you know, San Antonio, we have two municipally owned water and electric utilities. And so there really is an opportunity to kind of work together on the, the water energy nexus. Uh, so we think about water a lot. There is some excellent leadership on the, on the stage today. And this question is, is, is for all of you. Where do you see leadership coming from in, in the future? Who are the champions on this issue in your mind? Who do you look to as champions? My, my answer to that was cities. And, and I don't just mean Texas. I mean globally. I feel like cities are where the leadership is emerging. And this, what's happening right here, is an example of that. I mean, I'll, I'll, that's not an easy um, question. I mean, I think there's all you folks, uh, you know, who took time to come here and listen. And so I think you guys have a, a responsibility. Um, and I think in order to make this San Antonio plan successful and, and implementable and have legs, it's got to be cross-sector. I mean, we need business champions. We need industry champions. We need, you know, equity champions. Um, it's, it's, this has to be a plan that everybody sees um, the benefit and the need to, um, to accomplish. Otherwise, it'll be challenging. And, and the fact is, the clock's ticking. Yeah. And, um, you know, we need to, to be aggressive. Uh, I would second that. I think we, we talked already in the questions about the concept of, of personal responsibility, that, that really climate change is something that each and every one of us can contribute to, either through our personal actions or through engaging and, and trying to have conversations with people around you. So, so I, I would, in addition to cities, I would agree that this is the leadership need to come from each and every one of us. And I would particularly single out students, I'm biased, being, being a faculty <laughs> member. I, I really yeah. think that the future will be them. And, and I see a lot of hope in my students that, that I know would, would be realized over the next few years. Yeah. I would also, I mean, I think most people, to Dr. Hayhoe's comments, I think uh, most people get this. There are a few holdouts still out there. But whether, you know, we've got a, a city that has a very forward-thinking mayor, and, and council, and so there's opportunity there at the city from a leadership standpoint. Uh, you've got the utility that's very forward thinking as well, so you've got them at, at the table. Uh, homes and business, I mean, you've got commercial customers that are basically saying, I want more renewables, I want to go 100% renewables. You've got you know, residential uh, customers with that same appetite. And so I think the momentum is there. How do you bring it all together? And that's part of what this process is all about. And I, I would offer one further thought too, and that is people, people often say, well, yes, climate change is important, but it's not really the most important thing for me. And to that, I would say, you know, climate change isn't on my priority list either. It isn't. It's not top 10, it's not top 20, it's not even top 100. Why do I care about a changing climate? I care about it because it affects all of the other things that are already on my priority list. It affects the safety and the welfare of my family and my community. It affects the price I pay for food, water, energy. It affects the quality of the air I breathe. It affects national security and international stability. Um, it affects social justice. People are disproportionately affected by a changing climate, no matter whether they live, they live here or in Syria. The lower down the socioeconomic scale they are and the less advantages they have today. And so I would just say, if, you, you know, if you're talking to somebody who kind of feels that this isn't really my issue, Figure out what their issue is, and nine times out of ten, you can connect the dots between what's at the top of their priority list and this. I agree. There's some folks. I, have a, I feel very comfortable in this audience as a fellow senior citizen. We're here collectively uh, with a great deal of experience mm -hmm. and shared wisdom. I'm concerned about the plan that you're having, you're, you're going to develop, but I'm also concerned about the people that are going to use it, and those are our students. How are we going to factor this information? How are we going to get this plan before our students to understand the future for their, for, by themselves? Uh, we better be very careful that we don't stretch it too far, put the plan way out in front of us, and our future generation doesn't buy in. 
Yeah, before Hazen jumps in on that question, I 100% agree with you, and hopefully we capture that up there because uh, one of the reasons we partnered with UTSA is that is that student aspect, and so uh, you know we we are looking for UTSA to kind of really help us with that. But I think that's a great great point, and we need to think more about how to engage that, the younger generation on this issue because it affects them the most. Absolutely. I, I think I think this is again has been something that's been on, on the mind of our team since we started talking about this. We know that we're being in a university that gives us great access to students and, and we, we fully intend to take advantage of that, engage the students, try to get them to understand why we're doing this. And and honestly in in, in, in my experience they understand it, they get it. And and they understand it a lot easier than, than, than many others. So uh, but I agree with you completely and, and in general, one of the things that, that we have discussed again within our team and with the city and with CPS is that we care a lot about developing a plan that has the highest possible opportunity of being implemented. And that requires buy-in. That requires you to be, to be engaged, to, have, to feel, get a sense of shared responsibility. Uh, and, and we hope that through our engagement process, through providing you with, with the information that you need to make informed decisions, that we can develop that buy-in and that sense of shared responsibility. I'm just going to say two quick things, and then because Catherine's going to have to head out soon, so I'm going to be super quick. So um, you're, you're absolutely right. I think one of the, my objectives is to work with the team to develop those materials that can be dispersed to K through 12 and colleges where teachers can engage with their students and then transmit those results to us. The other thing I would mention is seniors are a key group um, that we want to engage in, uh, engage with. You guys have been here the longest. You guys have seen these trends. We want to be able to capture that and, and tell those stories to say, this isn't just anecdotal. Um, this this is happening, and here's my story. Yeah. What's the name of the event? Okay. Right. Um, there's a the uh, the mayor. Yeah, Nuremberg used an expression that I found very touching. He said the word, in spite of lack of national leadership. And I think that's a very strong message that we have to realize that there is going to be some need for coordination. Since there's no central leadership of, of, of any sort, we need to have these efforts, like what's going on in San Antonio, coordinated, coordinated with that of other cities. Uh, and I'm proud to see that happening. But uh, also, uh, Dr. Hill talked about a what appears to be a systems uh, issue we're dealing with here. Very little, small, smart actions that can be taken in different ways. And uh, the question I have, maybe for Doug as well, is where, what's the, I guess, the direction in terms of capturing the successes of these small, smart steps? Because they're so small, they could be missed. I mean, they have to build up to something, but they're going to take time to build up. So what's the mechanism you're thinking of for capturing these small successes and really building them up into something big? And that, I mean, that's pretty much been the big challenge my entire career. No, no, no matter where I've been, it's always been, you know, from the sustainability perspective, working in other cities is there's all these things going on. Um, and how do, you, how do you capture them? And then how do they add up? So I think for, for this planning process, um, I, I think... In, Uh, as we develop them and really trying to quantify additional impact. So I think it's got to be a really systematic process um, to look at all those um, leverage points and interconnections. And, and when I was in Albany, we developed a comp plan, and it was uh, we had a consultant, uh, Wallace Roberts and Todd, who had some pretty innovative people, and it was sort of like the first plan that looked at sort of systems thinking. And it had all sort of the sorts of crazy terminology that he was throwing into it, but it was an attempt to start looking at all those interconnections. Um, I think it works. It, it helps prioritize and, and really look at, you know, if this action pulls 10 levers uh, and this one only gets two, maybe we should concentrate on this. So I think that's part of the process that's going to help us when we start looking at how we implement this plan. Absolutely. This is probably one of the key strategies that we're, we're aiming to use as a team. Uh, our intent is to look at all possible options. We're not really taking any prior positions. 
with regard to which which strategy will be more useful or more successful. We're going to look at them all, but we're going to look at them all as comprehensively as we can. We're going to look at the costs and benefits, the, the straightforward economic analysis, but we're also going to look at other indirect impacts, co-benefits, avoided costs, all of the other interconnections and relationships that we all know exist and, and that often get neglected and not accounted for. So we'll try to capture that as much as possible so that when, when again, when, when somebody makes a decision about selecting strategy A versus strategy B, it, is an, it becomes an informed decision, an decision that has the most likelihood of success. So I think one last question, quick question for Catherine, and I also want to mention, um, if somebody with a uh, microphone, there's some whole bunch of very patient people down so here. So this, this last question is only for me because unfortunately I have to leave after this. I don't live in San Antonio. Lubbock. We'd love to have you here. <laughs> yes, thank you. I will come back if you invite me. Um, but they will be here to continue to answer questions. So if there's somebody who has a question specifically for me, oh, we got a question right here specifically for me. And then others, if you follow my Facebook page, you'll, you'll get the notifications for our Q&As that we have on Facebook. That's a great way to connect in the future. So right here is the question for me. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you initially mentioned that China and India are ahead of us. Oftentimes when I am trying to have a discussion with regard to climate change, people will point them out and say, well, what about China and India? Do you have any sources um, to which you can refer us about exactly what China and India are doing that we could use to educate ourselves to have be prepared to um, counter those comments. Yes, uh, so we do have a global weirding video <laughs> on renewable energy that talks a lot about what's happening in other countries, but I'm glad you raised that because this is one of the most important, oh yeah, but what about questions that people say. They say, well, what if we, this is how it goes, what if we ruin our economy, and now that itself is a false statement because of course wind and solar grows our economy, it doesn't ruin it. Yeah, there's many more jobs in the solar industry now than in the coal industry, and in fact the Museum of mining in Kentucky put solar panels on their roof. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And a Chinese company went into Wyoming and is retraining coal miners in Wyoming to do wind installations. So, so that in itself is, 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 a, is a false statement that it would destroy the economy. But the second part is because they're so dirty. Why do they say that? It's because every picture that we see of air quality in China looks like what? Awful. Did you know that living in Beijing actually shortens your life by an average of five years? But because their air quality is so bad and right in front of their eyes, they recognize that coal is not the answer. And so China has not been building a new coal power, power, power a new coal fired power plant today. They've actually been shutting them down. They're building wind energy, they're building solar energy, they have more wind and solar than any other country in the entire world. They're investing $360 billion in continuing to grow their clean energy economy in the next two years. India is setting records for the cheapest solar prices on record in the entire world without subsidies. And the things that are happening in the emerging economies are stunning. They're so stunning that I think there's a serious concern of the U.S. being left behind technologically if it doesn't pull up its socks. And that is the message that we can reply to people and say, we don't want to be left behind anymore. It's not a case of us being out here and them being back here. No, they have overtaken us in many ways, not every but many, and we are in serious danger of falling behind. So thank you so much, everyone. This is thank you so much. Now I want to see how many people leave. Well, you know, what I would say, you know, we'll, we'll still take comments and questions, but I think more importantly, we have a website that is saclimateready.org that just went live today. If we could uh, get it on the screen here, and it's an, it's an opportunity for you to kind of connect. So you can register, you can, you know, submit your comments or questions there. So that's another forum there in addition to this. But, you know, this is a journey we're going to go through. Public dialogue, public input will continue to be very, very important. Uh, we're happy to, you know, to take some more comments, but I, you know, why don't we take a few? This is this one. And then, uh, and then the, under the okay. blue blazer has been so patient. So if we can get a, or, or if we just want to yell your.
information that you can give us and we'll be happy to talk to you about that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, oh, it's data, and I think well, it's 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 local data, and I think it's quantitative as well as qualitative data. Yeah, I, I think I think it's a good thing to capture. Also, Rhonda, I know we're trying to capture some of these ideas. Is is there a way for the public to give data and input as they see it in the community? Is there a framework? Is there a way that we can capture that? So well, we'll, we'll capture that. And give at that this thought. point, you can use our email sa-climateready at utsa.edu, but we will have other methods of engagement that that will allow you when you talk to to send us data directly, but absolutely, just send us an email and we'll, we'll get in touch with you and we'll coordinate with you. Great. This question's for Doug, uh, over here, Doug. Uh, you know, whenever we sign the Paris Climate Agreement, you know, that is very focused on emission reduction. I feel like we're talking a lot about resiliency and adaptation to climate change. When are we going to start talking about emission reduction and climate change prevention? It's, it's both. I think the first phase of the plan is um, uh, the climate mitigation component, the climate action component. So right now, um, Hazem's team is basically um, uh, gathering all the data to update the, the 2014 greenhouse gas inventory for community and municipal operations, um, developing those long-term trends, and start developing the strategies specifically focused on um, um, reducing emissions through buildings, energy system, transportation, solid waste. And then there's some overlap where it starts shifting into more of a, a climate adaptation um, process. So it's, it's we're, doing, we're doing both. Got a question right down here. Um, I'm a UTSA one. student, and I really want to know how I can personally get involved. Like on Send me an email. What's your email address? First name, not last name, but UTSA.edu. Can you, can you guys put that up there? Oh, send an email to us. Yeah, oh, this is the landing web, web page, so if you, okay. if you Just want to see. link to that or write it down. Okay. And we'll be in touch with you. Julia? Thank you. Someone else mentioned this earlier. I think um, bio, the threat to the loss of biodiversity is an important motivating factor, and it also resonates very well with the younger set yes. uh, that aren't having to pay their own bills yet and stuff like that. So I, I'd love to see that. It, it was really it. difficult to narrow down the sure. list of possible. Yeah. <laughs> there are quite a few of them. Yes, absolutely. And, and actually the, the plan uh, includes, when we start getting to the adaptation and the resilience discussion, basically natural resources and natural systems, whether it's water, air, and all that, or biodiversity. Thank you. Um, I was struck by one of the, uh, Dr. Hale's slides that showed that South Miami has instituted a rule that uh, all new construction have uh, solar panels on the roofs. Uh, with the upcoming population change that uh, we're anticipating for, for San Antonio, I think this is a really uh, necessary thing that we ought to put it in and into the Universal Building Code that we have a requirement to put solar panels on, on rooftops uh, in the future. I'd just like to add a personal anecdote on this. We had one of the first solar, uh, rooftop solar systems in San Antonio about 10 or 11 years ago. And uh, there's a little known uh, reference in the uh, state code that you can't, your property assessment has to, cannot include the price of these solar systems. Uh, when we appealed that to the, to the BAD, to the Bear Appraisal District, they said, oh, we've already figured that in. Uh, so I think there has to be some uh, really uh, aggressive action to try to enforce the law that is on the books right now that says that your house should not be appraised to include the price of that solar system. It should be deducted from that appraisal and reduce your property tax. Basically, I think all, you know, all these strategies, all these barriers to implementing strategies are going to be on the table for, for evaluation. way of follow-up on what the gentleman just said, especially on the north side, a lot of the uh, developments and neighborhoods, this is at the lowest level of government, I suppose you could say, have HOA agreements that are very restrictive in terms of what kind of roofing you can get. I really liked uh, her idea. Obviously, with these steep roofs, we can't green our roofs, but we can certainly lighten up the uh, shingles. Mm -hmm. And if you could find a way, uh, I believe the Texas legislature some years ago passed a, a law about water catchment. 
they said homeowners associations can't prohibit them. They can tell you got to put a fence around them, but they can't prohibit them. And so if we could get some sort of action along that line, I think it would help for those of us who are facing a new roof in the next five to ten years. Okay. Thank you. Hey. <clears throat> Hi. Um, I know this uh, this system has just been, like, this is the kickoff and it's the beginning, but I was wondering if, um, you know, as everyone here probably knows, Sweden runs on, like, waste. Um, I was wondering if you guys are tackling at all or acknowledging waste in San Antonio that you can, you know, look to in the future and maybe reduce or use as energy. Is that something y'all have talked that's, about? That, that is part of the plan. That is part of uh, where waste is a, one of the sources of greenhouse gas emissions that we're looking into in developing the inventory right now. And certainly strategies to re reduce the emissions coming out of waste will be among all the other strategies that we would be addressing. Yes. And, and the city's solid waste department has current um, uh, reduction goals and we'll be working with them and folding them into the process as well as the community mm -hmm. to start looking at you know, um, where are we going with waste in terms of those long-term uh, greenhouse gas reduction uh, objectives? Hi. So uh, right now we're blessed with a wonderful mayoral administration and leader and great council leadership um, that that instigated all of this in, in an essay climate ready. What are the plans for? I, I'm a San Antonio resident and I and I plan to be here for a while. What are the What are the plans for? Um, being climate resilient decades into the future? And is, is there a sustainability pro just for this program? I mean, I think the key to this, well, one, we do have an office of sustainability that's been around, and I, and I think making making some headway. Um, I think in terms of this climate plan, I mean, the key is to make a, come up with a plan that's going to fit San Antonio. It's something that San Antonio can rally around. Um, we have two-year mayoral cycles, you know, so I think the goal is to come up with something that, um, it's just right, that's going to move us in the right direction. Um, I think we can be aggressive, uh, and, and I think we need to be very aggressive, but when we start looking at pathways, we need to come up with something that um, will weather changes in political um, uh, administrations. Um, I think that's why the engagement part is, and the education part is so important, because if it's something that there's no ownership across the board, uh, and I've seen this in other communities where I've worked, it's too easy to just basically say, well, that's not that's not my plan. Um, you know, let's do something else. Yeah, I would add, you know, hopefully 20, 30 years from now, we will look back at this moment in time and say, wow, this is when it all kind of came together for this community. So hopefully history judges well if we execute on this plan in the way that we need it to execute on this plan. So it's a great comment. Uh, let me ask Steve, who uh, is in the, you know, represents the business community, you know, that's one of the questions, how do you get some of the other state, you know, this is, you know, preaching to the choir, so to speak, but Steve Hennigan, who's the CEO of, of, uh, of uh, Credit Human, I wanted to get you, you your comments. Well, Chris, you know we're getting ready to build a sustainable building. Uh, the The challenges are have been, and as a pub, I was a former public policymaker, you know, here in town as well. the The environment is is getting closer and closer to shifting the tip. This is the group that's you know these are you don't need to convince this group. Uh, the The real challenges is the barriers to the groups that are not quite there yet. And that doesn't happen quickly. It takes time to do that. Uh, I can just tell you from trying to build, uh, you know, about a $150 million project here, the the key elements of a new building, just in the building component of the sustainable elements of the building, which will include rainwater capture and geothermal energy, solar, uh, and a tremendous uh, energy reduction plan that would reduce you know, energy by 40% and water usage about 90%. The, the professional expertise needed to lead that type of development, the knowledge creation, it's, it's, uh, we're fighting uh, conventional inertia, if you will. And so the MEP firms, the mechanical, electrical, and plumbing engineering firms that were part of the design, they had to come from out of state. Uh, typically, you know, when we do buildings, I, mean, I know I did my personal residence, many of those knowledge bases are not in our community, even though there's a demand for them. And really developing the skill sets is going to be equally as difficult as developing the plan. Uh, so when you have workers come to actually do this construction, it's, 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 it's new practices, it's new materials coming together. So I can just tell you to put $150 million into a new facility, that's a big decision all of itself. But then you've got to actually have the people that can creatively do it. I know it personally with our building, if I wasn't personally involved in the design of the building, it wouldn't have happened. 
even with the best intentions of the people that are on the plan. So it's it, the business community is important, but it's going to be really the trades and the crafts and the engineering firms that actually help move this. And you know, I can go on and on, but I think you get the point on that. No, that's a great point. I think we need to capture that as well. How do we how do we get the skill set and the knowledge here as we you know as we go down this this path and this journey? So I great comment, Steve. So I'm thinking this is all aimed at San Antonio and the quality of life, and this is wonderful. It has to be the case. However, uh, there are there's a context in which the air quality in San Antonio is being impacted negatively that does not fall within the city limits or even the county. And several years ago. Uh, Peter Bella, who I think I see down there in the first row, is that right? Uh, as the chief air quality enforcement official for ACOG, did studies which showed that the air pollution from the Eagleford Shale activities is moving into San Antonio and impacting, no matter how hard Peter worked and had it in compliance for nine years, it was starting to go up and now we're out of compliance. So, yes, there's other factors here that can be under the control of the city, but my question is, having learned from the past, and now that you're building this plan, and just about the time when some of the smaller communities in the Eagleford Shale are beginning to realize this is not all good news. And they're dealing with the air quality themselves, with the other factors that come with fracking and flaring and emissions out of the compressors, methane specifically. They're beginning to wonder what we can do about it, and they do not have the resources that a city the size of San Antonio does. So my question is, have you considered building into this process a networking with key officials in these lower counties to offer them some help in improving their quality of life? Because they're just getting to the point where they're ready to listen, I think. Yeah, and and that's, a, I mean, that's a great observation and really important. And when we started envisioning this process, it, it is. It isn't a city issue. I mean, this is. It's a. It's a, a regional, and it's a. It's, it's a large. I mean, it's beyond regional, and so you, you, we had discussions as far as how how do we do that, and what does that look like, um, and and what are the resources and the the, the avenues that we have. Um, I, I think I, I'm glad, and we can capture that comment. You know, talking to the mayor, um, talking to other city uh, leaders and business leaders, and because it's going to take, I think, all hands on deck to um, get everyone sort of at that table to begin that conversation. Uh, and I think also doing it in a way where it doesn't appear that it's the big city of San Antonio coming in and trying to get in people's um, um, corner, of the, corner of the state. But I think it's something we need to figure out because I, I think you're absolutely right. We're, we're blessed with resources um, and not just financial resources, but Human resources and people—you know—people who understand this—and I think we need to. That's something that we really need to consider during this process.
Absolutely. I think we captured it. That's a good, a good point. Well, it wouldn't be a climate event without Peter Bella weighing in. So, Peter. sustainableessay.com or sustainablecentone.com and I have a really good article on that site about the question I'm getting ready to ask. It's, it's great the sustainability and resilience and that sort of thing but how about uh, it being consideration building into and it kind of speaks to what Stephen was talking about uh, building in to the plan not just sustainability and resilience but eco-positive and being regenerative because we have the technology and actually I think educating people here locally, teaming up with the, the universities and stuff, and what kind of plans are there basically in regard to being planning for eco, being eco-positive and regenerative rather than just sustainable and resilient? I think the goal needs to come from the community. So whether we're, whether we reduce by 10%, 20%, 90%, 100%, 200%, that needs to be a goal that comes from the community, that the community uh, believes in and is committed to. So I think our role is, is to lay out all the options, and then we'll, we'll hear what people want to do. And I, I, I think it's a great suggestion. Yeah, I, mean, I, I, think, I would also say, look, I think a great suggestion also that part of this is technology. If there's technology out there that will vacuum all the carbon up and put it someplace, you know, I think we need to be open to what technology is out there and how can we uh, leverage that technology to kind of get to where we need to get to. And one great way to to, uh, to take carbon out of the atmosphere is plant a tree. So you know, so that that's something to think about. Okay. All right. Uh, well, again, I think we're you know coming to an end. We very much appreciate everyone's involvement, everyone's commitment here. Uh, we have the website to land on, um, and I want to give a, a, a thank you to the city and UTSA for for partnering with us on on this this thank effort. You. Thank you. Thank you all for coming.